I didn't win. <laughs> but one of the winners was Professor David Miller from University College in London, and he obviously had his eye to the main chance because he came up with a very nice political analogy which you've had transferred into a cartoon sequence to explain it. So his idea was, imagine the universe filled with party political workers from the Blue Party. And here they are. And see what happens when a particle comes into the room. So here's a particle entering the room. And immediately, all the Blue Party workers rush over and gather around her. This is the Higgs force at work. They're clustering around this particle as she enters. The result of this is that she sort of gains inertia. It's hard to, to move. But once moving, it's harder to stop. And so here you have the idea that this Higgs force grips itself onto certain types of particles, the ones that go the blue route, and give them this inertia, a mass. And that, that is at the root of the mass of particles, this fifth force, the Higgs force. Now, if this idea is right, we're going to have to look for some ways of testing it. And this is now what people are about to do. Now, Bryson has made a demonstration here, and it goes back to the days of Faraday, who founded these lectures 160 or so years ago. Faraday was famous, among many things, for discovering the secrets of electricity and magnetism. And this is a demonstration of magnetic effects. So think magnetic forces for this demonstration at the moment. And you see, as Bryson moves the magnet around underneath this, these iron filings are sort of representing the field of the magnetic forces. The magnetic forces cluster the iron filings into clumps. Now these clumps show up in our detectors like particles. Now, instead of thinking this real thing as the world of magnets and magnetic force, think of it in the world of Higgs force. This is the field of blue party workers clustering around. And the clusters in this field of the Higgs force will manifest themselves as particles. The basic idea that we have today is that forces are transmitted by particles. And this Higgs force will be transmitted by Higgs particles. These force carriers, we call them bosons. So this is the Higgs bosons that everybody is looking for. If this idea is right, they are the things that we will find first. Well, the hunt for those things is on right now. This is actual living science of today. And what the answer is going to be, I don't know. That's for the future, for another year. So let's bring this whole series now to a close by asking the question, why do we do it anyway? Well, one answer to this is that it's answering the big questions of how did it all begin? How does the universe work? What's it all about? And that is a great cultural drive. It's been common to cultures throughout history. And we're the first to have been able to put numbers on by experiment. So we are lucky to be alive at a time when these sort of questions are being answered. The second thing that comes out of this is that you suddenly discover things that you didn't expect. And you open up totally new avenues that nobody knew was there before. And let's stick with the case of Faraday and draw the analogy with Faraday again. Back in the 19th century, Faraday was doing experiments just by curiosity. He was interested in electric and magnetic forces. Faraday discovered that electricity and magnetism were not two different forces, but one, which we now call electromagnetism. He discovered that when he sent an electric current down a wire, and that there's mercury at the bottom of the tray that conducts it, electricity and magnetism conspire to make motion you've got the original motor. So that discovery came just from curiosity. And today, you have lights and television and the whole of modern electronics and communications going back to those curiosity-driven experiments of Faraday here at the Royal Institution. So that shows that you can end up with things you never anticipated to begin with. 
Now Faraday tried doing much more than that. I mean, in his day, the only forces that were known were gravity, electricity and magnetism. Having successfully united electricity and magnetism into one, which we now call the electromagnetic force, gravity, he tried to bring into the picture. And here at the Royal Institution is a cartoon showing an experiment that he did trying to unify gravity and the electromagnetic force. He dropped some spheres from the roof of the RI down onto a cushion at the bottom, passed an electric coil, hoping that an electric current would pass and be revealed on this counter. He didn't succeed. And we haven't yet succeeded today. But this is another of the big challenges that we're trying to face. When we look at the equations, we get the feeling that deep down, gravity and all the other forces somehow are the same. And maybe Faraday's idea of trying to unify them was the right thing to do. But now we know so much more that maybe we'll be a little bit nearer to getting there. And if it succeeds, who knows where that goes. So, let's think about Higgs and go out with this. If the Higgs force, the fifth force, really is the source of the mass in the universe, what might that do? Let's, for the last time, look at the most famous equation in physics. E equals mc squared. Mass is energy. And the relationship between them is this huge number, the velocity of light squared. What this is saying is that mass contains energy. Mass is energy. You can get energy out from mass. That is what may be the exciting future. You see, what I've got here is a little one kilogram block. Imagine that this was a one kilogram block of chocolate. If you eat this chocolate, it would provide you yourself with enough energy to keep going for about a day. The most efficient energy process that we know has still only been able to extract at most 1% of the total energy contained in the E equals mc squared. Just imagine what we could do if we could get all of it out. There's enough energy in the mc squared of this block that if you could extract it and use it, it could supply the total energy needs of the whole of the country for a week. Now, I don't know if it's possible to do that. But if it is possible, then I feel that if we really understand what mass is, then maybe that might be the key to getting it out and doing it. That's for the future. So that is the big question that we're pursuing right now. We're building a huge machine in the hope of being able to solve this question of What's really going on? What is the source of mass? Is there the Higgs force out there? This are the exciting questions that we're looking at, and the answers will probably be coming sometime in the next 10 to 15 years. Now, there's many of you in this room here who are of an age that in 10 to 15 years' time, you could well be doing your PhDs, probably in particle physics. And just imagine for a moment, it could be you doing the night shift, looking at the computer, all on your own, three o'clock some morning, early in the next century, when the picture comes up before you, and there it is. Suddenly, the proof is there, and you are the first person in history to know this secret of nature. All the generations that have ever lived do not know this fact. There are five billion people on the planet who do not know the fact that you there are looking at a new secret of the universe. From tomorrow, everybody will know about it in the papers and the media, but for this moment, it's your discovery. Good luck.